Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today I thought you might be interested to see what's in my everyday carry. In other words, when I go to a Skywatch, what do I take with me? I've got a lot of equipment around here, but 95% of it I never even consider taking with me to a Skywatch. So I thought you might find this useful if you've never been to a Skywatch, if you've never run a Skywatch. So our club has an affiliation with the Waterville Valley Resort up in northern New Hampshire. Once a month they have an astronomer in residence program. I am the astronomer for this month. I'm going to go up there and I'll give a talk and I'm going to run a skywatch. So the resort is about 100 miles north of here, so this is a two-day trip. So I'm going to have to pack carefully. So let's take a look at what I'm going to take. Okay, so those of you who know me well know that I'm going to be taking my Orion X-T8. This is my 8-inch Dobsonian. And, you know, I still get some messages from people who say, I want something more portable than an 8-inch Dob. Well, I don't know how you define portable, but, you know, it does weigh about 40 pounds. And there are two pieces, and each one of the two pieces weighs about 20 pounds. And I don't know, that's kind of portable to me. <laughs> you know, I, I can be observing in sometimes less than one minute. I'll just pull the pieces out, put the thing together and uncap the dust cap and I'm observing. Perhaps even more importantly, at the end of the evening, it takes me less than a minute to pack up and leave. So if you've got a complicated equatorial mount with batteries and cables, you're gonna be there for quite a while. So think about that the next time you think about portability. I also carry this. This is a folding observing chair that I have. One thing that's peculiar about the XT series Dobbs, they're all got their quirks, but this one, see those springs on the side, you hear that? I don't wanna to listen to that for a hundred miles. So my solution to that is to get some masking tape and I'll tape those down just before I take off. So, you know, I get asked a lot what eyepieces I use. And I'm constantly telling people, you don't need more than three or four eyepieces total. Yeah, I know they're fun to buy and they're fun to collect, but you really don't need more than three or four of these. I've got cases full of eyepieces. So, it, 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 do as I say, not as I do. So on a case like this, what I'll usually bring here is my 27 millimeter panoptic from Teleview. This is the low power eyepiece. This is in the telescope probably 80% of the time. When I need to get a little bit closer, say for planets or the moon or something like that, I'll use this. This is my 13 millimeter Nagler Type 1. And this will bring me to about 100 power. I really don't like going much higher than that because once you go higher in magnification, it gets a little cumbersome that you keep pushing the telescope along with a long line of people looking through your scope. Now they do make a new version. This is the Teleview 13 millimeter Type 6 Nagler. This is interesting because functionally these two eyepieces are identical. You get the same view through both of these. They just redesigned this one to be a little bit smaller. I usually take the, the Type 1, the older one, for one reason. The 27 millimeter Panoptic is a two inch eyepiece. This is a two inch eyepiece. I don't have to mess with any adapters. Okay, so usually on these trips, I'll try to double up on my activities. In other words, while I'm showing th people things through the telescope, I'll have an imaging rig running off to the side. And what I usually do is I get there early and set this thing up and automate it so that it's running while I'm showing things to people. And so I have these Celestron AVX mounts, which you've seen. I have three of these things. <laughs> and those of you who have owned electronic mounts will be able to verify this. I gotta pick one of these because there isn't one of these that is working 100%. This one here that I'm holding up here is missing its legs, but I can swap that through. It's the newest and it's probably the best of the three, except the auto guider port is just really wonky and I can't trust it. This one here is convinced it's the year 2000 and cannot be convinced otherwise. This one has some right ascension drive issues. Pick your poison. Probably gonna go with this one. So the imaging telescope I'm gonna bring is this. It's my trusty Takahashi FS60. And this mess here is exactly that. It's a huge mess. I have a tub here that I use for a shelf. This is an ancient laptop from around 2005, running Windows XP, sort of. It runs the auto guider. Auto guider is here. And again, I have three of these. These are 
SBIG STI series models. One of them is already dead. That is a discontinued model. I don't know what I'm gonna do when the other two start failing. And this is an AC adapter for the mount. So I usually there is power at this place. I can run a long extension cord to the side of a building, but I can't count on that. So in those cases, I will bring this. I carry this with me wherever I go. This is an inverter. And I've got a car battery, a tractor battery rather, in the footwell of the passenger side there. And I'll connect this to the battery. It's an inverter. I've got a power strip and I can run power this way. I prefer not to do that, but it's always there in case of an emergency. So all of this stuff that will fit into the tub will go into the tub before it goes into the car so that you can't see it. And uh, that's pretty much it. So let's go ahead and get the rest of the stuff into the car and let's make the trip up to Waterville Valley. So here we are at Waterville Valley Resort, one of the most iconic and photographed places in the entire state. You know, it's so nice here. I've actually toyed with the idea of moving up here, but I tend to come here in the summertime when it's all warm and idyllic like this. And I tend to forget in the wintertime, wind chills can get down to minus 20 or 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's make our way over to the Curious George Cottage and take a look. So here we are at the Ray Cultural Center. Margaret and H.A. Ray were the creators of the Curious George Children's Book Series, and they were also amateur astronomers, hence the creation of this program. You can see that there is an observatory dome behind me here. That dome has gone through some disrepair through the years, and they're trying to raise their funds to restore the thing again. But they were also the authors of The Stars, A New Way to See Them. It's a commonly recommended book for beginners about how to learn the constellations. So Margaret and H.A. Ray fled the Nazis in Paris just before they got there at the start of the Second World War, fled on their bicycles carrying the Curious George manuscript with them, and wound up here in the northeast part of the U.S. Okay, so I'm back, and I thought things went pretty well. So this has happened to me before, about two minutes before I was scheduled to go on for my talk. There was nobody in the cottage. I mean, nobody. And then about 30 seconds before I was scheduled to go on, a big string of cars pulled in, and we had 30 plus people packed in that little cottage, standing room and sitting room only. I felt my talk went pretty well, and then afterwards we went out with my 8-inch Dobsonian, and under clear dark skies, I showed a number of objects to the people out there. I think the favorite out there was probably M13. A lot of people got to look through a telescope for the first time, and the dimmest thing we saw is probably that galaxy pair M81 and M82. Not everybody could see that. That's not unusual for somebody looking through a telescope for the first time. And by the way, they kept me up until almost 11 p.m., which is pretty good considering we had families with small children. Even the kids wanted to stay up and look through the telescopes. But after everybody left, I set up my imaging equipment I was really grateful that there were people who wanted to stay that long, but the disadvantage of that is uh, I didn't start imaging until almost midnight, and I was up there for another two hours or so collecting data, and those of you who have done astrophotography before know, uh, know that two hours is really not a lot of time. So I did get AC power off of the side of the building, so I didn't have to use the inverter, and did anybody mind that I was using power off the property? Uh, I don't know, it was after midnight, so nobody knows. So I find that after midnight or so, especially in a place like this, it's so dark and so clear. There's a kind of peace that settles over the world, and I just like sitting out there and observing the stars, even without my telescope. So after a while, I got tired and packed up, and getting back to the hotel, I'm always struck by the beauty of Waterville Valley. This place just looks like something out of a fairy tale. So they put me up in one of the ski lodges here. Really interesting place to be, very comfy, very cozy, but I didn't get to see any of this because I didn't get in until after 2 a.m. I didn't see any of this until the following morning. So how did the astro photos go? Well, they're not too bad. Here's a few of them that I took. This is the North America Nebula. This is the NGC 6960 portion of the Veil Nebula. That's the portion with the star 52 Cygnus inside of it. Here is the Crescent Nebula, NGC 6888. 
and here is a random star field that is supposed to be M17, but is not M17 because the AVX mount missed and I didn't bother to check. So I'm showing this to you because you know what? I spent time almost 2 a.m. taking this photo. You're gonna see it. So there you have it, folks. A look at my everyday carry and what happens during a typical skywatch. I hope you found this information useful and entertaining. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.